suit reformer. They just want to fix that shoe. Just want to be able to work very well with civil service agency, bringing about the needed reform in that area. We have absolutely no doubt his capacity, his ability to carry on the needed reform in the health sector as we work towards rebuilding our health sector. And so we'd like to applaud John Wonder and to say to our friends who are talking about both degree to think again. You don't need a medical degree. We saw that shiny example here with public works with the Minister Kofi Wu performing very well. John Wonder without any doubt with the reform agenda of this government will be able to reform the health sector. And so when it comes from ground crew, it comes from ground crew. Another person came from the southeastern region is our own care sister, a big sister from Maryland, and Elizabeth Russell David. Somebody who has been able to reform the Tuffman University. That was a facility, somebody said, of Gracie Katu. Today, She's now raising and developing the human minds. We have absolutely no doubt, no ability to begin reform our educational setting. And so, we can't find the words to describe how pleased we are with the level of configuration that the president has done in our government. I speak to all of us that we are on the crescendo of productivity. Productivity at its highest level. We just like to congratulate all these very distinguished, competent people who the leader has brought on board to serve the Liberian people. We have no doubt in the ability that we will be able to perform the task diligently. So we congratulate them with all the emphasis at our command. With a few comments, let me now invite to the podium. I will today discussing Mr. Hans Rosling. Mr. Hans Rosling, as I said earlier, is a distinguished professor of international health. He's here working hard. We'll be looking at the data analysis. We we'll basically are meeting to do data we'll be collecting. He will tell us what the data means and what the implication has for our country effort in combating Ebola. So we have much ado. Thank you very much for inviting me here, and it's a privilege to talk to the media, which is so important in relation to this epidemic. It's always important, but it's especially important in a situation like this. My background is that long time ago, when I was young, I was district medical officer in northern Mozambique for three years. And, and that's why I have some sort of personal experience of limited resources. And during 25 years, I've studied, together with African institutions, epidemic diseases across Africa. But I'm new to Liberia. I'm new to West Africa. I came as far as Nigeria. But uh, my task here has been to work in the Ministry of Health. That's why you see my first slide here has the logo Minister of Health. I don't come with an institution here or an organization. I come here as an individual professor from my university, paid by my university, just putting my service here at this post. Now, I would like to say very clearly, I don't feel like coming here helping Liberia. I come here working together with Liberia to help the world. Because what you are doing with this epidemic in this country is a very fine protection of the rest of the world. You are stopping. The virus came down from the mountains, past Lofa, reached an airport, and now you are stopping it here. The world is very grateful for that. You should be clear on that this is not a national or a local problem. This is a global issue. Just to emphasize the historic importance of this, it just happens, you know, almost once a century that a virus steps out of the animal kingdom and establishes itself among humans. This Ebola virus has tried that several times, but it has been pushed back in Congo. It was pushed back in Uganda. It lives among some animals. We don't know specifically. Maybe mainly the fruit bat, maybe others. 
that there shows how little research has been done on this, on this disease. It's a shame for the world not having done more research before this situation. That's why we are standing now without a, a fast test. We are standing without the drug. We are standing without the vaccine. That's why it becomes so heroic to, fa to, uh, to fight. But now the transmission is not from animal to human, from human to human, from human to human. And that's what we have to stop. It take us months, but it is within our hand. And when I say we, I don't mean the Iberia, I mean the world at large. It is within our hands to stop this within month so that we can push the virus back to the animal kingdom. And then I can assure you that vaccine, drug, or rapid test will come along. The world has seen this, and the world has enormous resources to develop such technology once we decide to do it. It hasn't been decided to do it before, but that's the decision to do. Now, completely my task here is to review then the, the data, which is from the epidemiological surveillance team at the Ministry of Health, led by Luke Baum. I share office with Luke Baum. I start by showing this curve here. This curve is the green one, is what was published in the end of September. What it shows is the month down here, August, September, October, November. And on the, on the vertical axis is the number of newly Ebola infected persons per week in Liberia. During August, the data was quite good because the number of patients matched the number of Ebola treatment centers and the capacity of the country and of the international response. So using the data during August, the researchers and scientists could tell what would happen if everything continued the same. Now be careful. This line, this line going up here, the green line, that was published in the end of September, was not a prediction. It was a projection. It was not what they thought would happen. It was what would happen if nothing changed in the country. If funerals continues at the head down, if health service continued at its head down, if no action were taken on, on community level, on national level, on international level. We knew that that would be made. We knew that it wouldn't follow this line. <clears throat> but, but what we didn't know was how much it would deviate. Now, the blue ones here is the number of patients diagnosed with Ebola per week here in Liberia. It was, in the beginning of September, around 200, 220 per week. Some extra cases, of course, in remote communities, some parts of Monrovia, but we don't think there were so many. Most were diagnosed, 2,200. Look, by the beginning of October, it had increased, indeed. It reached 300, 350, something like that. But not as bad as if nothing would have happened. Now remember that the number of cases we diagnose one day reflects the action taken 14 days earlier. Because the incubation period, the period between getting infected and showing symptoms is like two weeks on average. Can be three weeks can be one week, but on average like two weeks. That means when we see this curve changing course here in October, it was due to things down in the middle of September. There's a delay in our, in our seeing the effects. And the fantastic thing here is that instead of continuing up, you curb this epidemic in Liberia. You curbed it, and by the beginning of November, we are back in the same number. And yes, see the difference. Had nothing been done, we would have been facing in the beginning of this month 2,200, and now we have 220. That's one zero less. That is why the Ebola treatment units being planned and now being today, I apologize, even on behalf of my own country, we were too slow, too bureaucratic. We are coming with the resources now, which would have been badly needed swiftly in September. The world was not prepared. It became willing, but it was not prepared. We had planned for Ebola treatment units for 100 beds in each county. Now, 
it is ten that we we need. It makes sense, doesn't it? If the borrowing was two thousand two hundred and it comes out with two hundred and twenty, it's not that the those units are needed, but not as big. There are other things needed. And I will show you that by moving away from this overall overview graph to give you a more detailed graph. This is a curve almost day by day, but it shows the average in the last week of the number infected, but it's the daily infected in the country. In end of August, it was between 10 and 20. And you remember this horror period when it went up like this in the beginning of, of August. Here it was a failure of diagnosing all, all cases. We have to be clear, the reporting system collapsed during the week. Collapse is not the right word. It became insufficient. It continued to work, but it was missing cases. That was inevitable. So somewhere the true line would be somewhere up here. But by the end of September, it flattened, and this is the decline. There is no doubt that this decline occurred. I was not involved in it. I'm an independent researcher from outside. What we have done here is... What we have done here is to just use the laboratory diagnosis, not go through the database. We freshly took all laboratory diagnosis, and we can say that this has gone down. But the important thing is the decrease is now much slower. It has almost stopped at the same level as this was in all. So the first phase, this horrible, tragic, high epidemic, that is over. But the threat is still here with us. Let me go even more in detail. This is day by day from the 25th of October up to the 14th of November, Saturday. The bars, the dog bar here, shows the number of probable cases and these are suspected cases. And you can see it's more or less the same. There's an enormous variation day by day, but it's the character of this disease. You can also see that it's a little lower during weekends. So be careful when looking at weekends. Now, the red dots here shows the laboratory confirmed cases. 20, 21, 18, 16, 21. It hoovers there. Last Monday, we were up there. Partly because the new ETU unit at MOD1, Minister of Defense 1, opened there. And it came more example that validated. Then the last four days, it has been at a slightly lower level, but let's wait until we get the Sunday and the Monday numbers here. At the present situation, we can say it's more or less stable on this level. A little tendency of going down. That tells you that the speed in which it broke in October will not continue. We are now at a much lower rate of decrease because we are in a new phase. A phase which is distinctly different, and I show it in this very simple way. Very, very simple graph. On this axis, the number of deaths per day per one million people in the country. You could think about Greater Monrovia, one million people. The background mortality, the number of deaths that has been occurring over the last years in peace has been about 30 per day in this city. 30 per day. So this shows you what you could expect of other sorts of death. In September, Ebola came up like this, like a monster, like a crocodile who came out of the, of the water and attacked the village. And it became the dominant cause of death. It's against this situation that such effective measures were taken. Awareness of the population, which you greatly contributed to, Safe barrier is transport and insulation and treatment in the polar treatment unit and active uh, contact tracing. That brought it down to this situation. Now the crocodile is below the water, it's beneath the surface. It doesn't mean that it's safe. This is a very important message to have now. The crocodile who was up, everyone could see it, it was killing people on the street, they were lying on the street. It's now down in the water. And now Ebola is hiding 
among the other diseases. There are many causes of fever, diarrhea, and severe diseases in your country, malaria being one of the most prominent. But there are many others. And among those, Ebola is hiding. And then you must understand one very special, terrible thing with this disease. There is no way we can distinguish Ebola during the first days from other febrile diseases. No way. You can take the best clinical doctors in the world, and they can examine patients, they can listen to patients. It's no way they can say. It's only the laboratory test that will tell you yes or no. That means that when it starts hiding, when, when it goes into hiding between the other diseases, it becomes very risky with normal health service. And unfortunately, among the relatively low number last week, there were at least five healthcare workers infected. It's very risky in the health service. That means that the health service in its restoration that has started had to take very special measures of screening patients, of providing protection not only to the healthcare worker but also to other patients waiting in the list. And this has never been done before. What the country now is facing, together with the three neighboring nations, and I think we have to include Mali also, the four nations here are facing, is providing health service, basic health service, in a risky situation, where measures have to be taken with protection for the staff, with access to laboratory testing. And that's why the response has to change now. We need less beds, in the Ebola treatment center, we need more laboratories. We need much more testing. Not to confirm Ebola, but to exclude Ebola. If someone gets severely sick, a pregnancy, gets an infection, they need surgery, you need to know whether that patient is safe to do surgery on, or whether you have to have full protection. This is an enormous challenge, and, and I just want to convey to you that as a medical expert, we are very humble in this situation because we do not have these protocols. We had protocol on how you treat Ebola cases, but how do you treat someone who needs cesarean section? How do you treat someone who has a meningitis, severe infection? How do you treat someone who's probably had tuberculosis as a cause of the view when you are not sure that it's not Ebola? This is a great challenge, but it's your chief medical officer is already planning for this. Many of the foreign assistants will now focus on this. So we don't need many more beds in Ebola treatment units, but we need units in all, in all counties. That has still not been done. We have more beds than is needed in Monrovia, but we still have several counties which doesn't have uh, what is needed. And media have a special task here. Because with this terrible experience, this tragedy that struck upon your country, it's too easy now to say, oh, it's over. It's almost over. It's declining. Even the word retreating. I would say, yeah, the crocodile retreated to the water. But you won't send your children to swim in that water until you are sure that there's no crocodiles down there. So what is the next task? The next task is crystal clear what we need to do. This virus is stupid. <laughs> it's not clever. Yeah? It's, it, it's stupid. Yeah? It can't hide. If the, the virus falls on the street, sunshine will kill it. Sunshine will kill it when it dries up. I'm not scared of walking the streets here or eating in the restaurants here. I wash my hands carefully not to avoid the border. I wash my hands carefully to avoid other causes of diarrhea, so I don't have to be nervous. It's quite safe here, as long as you are not treating or caring for someone that is sick. That's when they just stop. Sharing life with Liberians who are healthy, that's safe. And it's very nice, I would say. I have to make a little pause here and thank for the enormous reception we have had at Sports Museum. We are deeply grateful of the spirit and the attitude and the, the warm and professional way in which we are being uh, integrated here in the country. I have worked in many, many countries across the world. Rarely, if ever, have I been received in such a nice way as here. 
And that is very admirable when it's this stress on it, on, on the situation. So, how do we find this? We have to be more clever than this stupid virus. And the virus can't travel. It's only humans who travel. The virus can't hide. It's only humans who can hide the virus. We need to find every case as soon as possible and make a list of all possible contacts. Contacts from the start of symptom to the isolation. And those contacts need to be visited daily for 21 days. That's for their own benefit as well as for the benefit of all their community. As soon as they get a slight fever, as soon as they get discomfort, they have to be tested to exclude a virus. If we do that, we will stop the spread of this disease. And this is the only way. The general measures of washing hands and, and, and keeping a good hygiene, that helps. But that's not what stops this. We have to follow the virus. It's like an octopus with arms, and it tries to get away. We have to cut all these arms. And we cut them by finding people early. If we find people early, the chances of survival is much better. Another message which is clear is that the quality of the treatment in these centers will improve immensely now when it's not crowded. Immensely perhaps was a strong word, but it will clearly improve. So the death rates, tragic death rates that we saw during September, that will not be in the, in the future. But also if people come early and get a better health, you know, it will be better. So both for the individual and for stopping it, we must find the cases early. And we must have acceptance for contacts being be accepting to report. So that people don't hide, don't travel away. If you are a contact, it's for your own benefit, for the benefit of your family, that you, you are on the list. We also find superstition about this disease. Let's be clear about that. And the superstition is mainly in the rich countries. I call it superstition. Because they are so scared in Europe, and they are so scared in America, so they don't act rationally. It's the rich countries that have the superstition. In your country, people are quite rational. They've seen the death, they've understood they have done something. Your spiritual leaders in both Christianity and Islam has done the right thing. They have, with very few exceptions, led the people to careful burial and so on. There are some TV companies in Europe that doesn't allow the journalists to come to Liberia. There are, there are a tendency of wanting to stop flights, which is absolutely not necessary. And it's, it's a scare which I, I just, I'm brutal, and I call it superstition. It's like something is dangerous out there. That won't work. But we have to convey this clear fact, not image, but fact about how things are in Liberia that it's gradually getting better now, and that the country is aware that there is a crocodile in the water still. We are going to trace that crocodile by finding the cases early, listing the contacts, visiting the contacts every day. How many do we have to visit? We have about 20 cases per day. We have to visit contacts of the cases we have the last 20 days. So 20 times 20, 400. Each case, each person on average have about 10 contacts. Some fewer, some more. So 400 times 10, 4,000. There are 4,000 people in the country each day that need to be visited. It was a little more in the past, but that's where we are. And as we press this down, that number will decrease and we can increase the quality. And when we come to the situation that all new cases occur among those contacts, then we can start preparing for the victory part. But there's one, there's one observation. If you are victorious and the neighboring countries are not, it won't happen. It will come back over your border. It didn't come from your country. It came from another place. We shouldn't blame that country. But we should be able that it can only be solved this if we get the other countries away. That's why it's so important. So the president rightly said that there is a chance that before Christmas, 
there is total the chance. There's a clear possibility if we act rationally and use the resources well that before Christmas we can have a date without any new case. But it means then continuing in January, February, really, really controlling the lost, lost cases. Because when we have a first zero day, if you take two days, then one case count, then one case count. But on that level, which I call the third phase, the elimination phase, that may take one or two months, but it entirely depends on the neighboring countries. It entirely depends on if the neighboring countries are there. So I think I'll conclude that. Congratulations to the first phase one. Warning for the second phase is by no means over. There's danger out there. And, and though it's at a low level, and it doesn't show any tendency to go up, you know? I think it's very positive here that, that this Monday was a little special. We know why it was high there. There is a slight tendency of going down, but you can see the speed here. Half a month, it moves down like this, and it will take two months more, three months more to hit zero. So we need to speed up. We need to increase the quality of the work now. But that can be done, because all those contact traces were all, and they were very rapidly trained. They were young people, educated, they need retraining, they need to be alerted to, to get that better quality of their interaction with the population, to, to have better data so that those who move the contacts can be traced in another country where they go. So increasing the quality of the second phase, we can hit the first day with zero before Christmas. But I've told my grandchildren, don't expect grandpa home for Christmas. Because I'm going to stay with you here until this is over. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I think that was a wonderful presentation by Mr. Hans. Uh, Professor Hans uh, Ruslan. Did a very beautiful presentation. We'd like to give all our Crocodile, and I think that was a very interesting analogy. But it's now below the water surface because below the water surface, and then it's, in, it's on retreat. So soon and very soon, we will be eradicating Ebola. All we need to do is remain vigilant. You know, when I spoke earlier, I, I congratulated the newly appointed officials of government. I thought it was really important to congratulate the president for her vision for believing in the young people. I just reminded myself that even the minister of youth spoke, the young man, I didn't call him name. So you sometimes you, 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 you slide into a little bit of error when you start calling him because the people are just too many. Too many young people just all over the government. The government is a watch for young people. It went to public operation. You go to Maritime, you see very young men there. You come down to uh, the Freeport, very young lady. You come to LPRC again, another young person. Then you go to LBS again, you get it. So all over the place, the government is a watch for young people. It also doesn't just lay to rest the generational argument. It lay also to rest the age argument. The president is now making us and convincing the making a case age is just a, a number. What matters is the mentality. What matters here is the mentality. You can be maybe 100 years old, but if you believe that young people can do the work, then it matters very little. There are some young people who will like you believe they are young people. So we are glad for the president's vision, in her wisdom, in making sure that the government is a watch for young people. We want to say this with emphasis. And that other argument about one that I heard on the talk show, that argument belongs only to the lazy man that people. It is a lazy argument to say that only medical doctors should go to Ministry of Health. Ministry of Health needs an adrat reform. And Mr. Warner will definitely be treated. So let that lay that argument to rest. It's a lazy argument if only come from lazy man that don't need a medical degree to run the Ministry of Health. Then we need a skillful reform. Because we need to build our health system again, rebuilding everything. The reform will be able to better do that. So I 
let me then indicate that hopefully tomorrow we we'll have the, the very able Minister of Finance to come and provide to us updates basically dealing with the economy. So tomorrow will be another engaging session. We encourage you to come on time. At this stage, I will ask uh, Director Paki to moderate the question and answer session. See, uh, we're almost at the close of the program. See, the only state family is first need to come on time. That'd be scientific. It's 11 a.m. scientific time. And so, Director Paki will moderate the question and answer session. And I will now invite to the podium Mr. Hans Bruce Professor Hans Bruce Lee, the question. Yes, the note. I'm trying to recall when we last had a medical doctor who was Minister of Health in our country. And I couldn't remember. At least for the last 50 years, we have not had it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We invite some questions. It seems to me that we do have for the distinguished professor. So it's like there's no question, he was very clear. Maybe you want to ask Mr. Johnson. You don't ask Professor, you can go and pull it for Thank you. My general experience in global development, because the last five to ten years I've spent lecturing at the highest level across the world about the progress of countries and what it takes to develop. What I think can be that threatens the world to stop Ebola, to eliminate Ebola most, is how the rest of the society functions. If health service cannot be restored, if there will be a continued economic downturn with unemployment and dissatisfaction, it will be very difficult to make this work for a border function. So that's the no way in which the country can first eliminate Ebola and then go on as usual. That won't work. I had the privilege to assist in the President's Council last weekend the discussion about two issues, the national burial place and the start of, uh, of schools. It was a very wise discussion, because starting school, there are pros and there are cons. If children don't go to school, what do they do then? Is it less risky for children to stay at home than it is if they go to school? For some, perhaps, but for most children it may not be. Now, if children go to school, there's a need for some sort of screening. If some child comes and is sick today, if they have fever, but if you look at children here, between 6 to 16, there's quite a number who have fever, 38 point something, when they come to school. So what happens at that point of, of screen? What happens there? This, this is difficult. The funeral practices, of course, have to go back, back to more dignified. Not more dignified, dignified, to stop funerals. And, and that has to be an acceptance that there will still be people who die from Ebola. Where should they be buried? Is it acceptable to have them buried in the same place? Cremation was not needed for safe burials. Cremation was needed here because there was no acceptance of rapidly arranging a place for burying the dead bodies. And, and that's very important to know that, that the normal burial, which is made in a safe way, of the victim of Ebola pose no threat whatsoever to the community close to that burial place. But I can understand the feeling people have. We don't want these burials to take place close to where we live. So that's an enormous challenge to handle this. It's also to be rational in that situation. And 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 could be good in this city to provide free swift testing of all who died so that you know that this is not a border and you can more rapidly proceed. And I know that the government is doing their very best to get that fast function. The normal function of the, the regular society, securing a good economy that you can come back on the track 
when countries progressing economically. I think that's very important. And that's why it's crucial that the surrounding world does not act with superstition, does not block people from here going on trading. I think it's terrible those countries who stop visa for people from, from Liberia who are planning to go and take a Moscow degree or whatever it is, just a hand present. And the way you can counteract that is by making this uh, contact tracing function. It's the discipline of people and the understanding of people that if you have been a contact to someone that had a border, it's for your own best, it's for the best of your family, for the country, the world, that you carefully follow that thing, uh, testing that you have a visit every day, and as soon as you have symptoms, you, you, you go and look for it. The virus cannot hide. It's only people who can hide the fact that they have they have a cold, uh, that they may have a cold. So that must be, we must have an alert that every fever, every severe diarrhea may be a cold. In this case, scary even for me. Huh? Scary even for me. If my thumb is going to make some problem, huh? what is this? But we have to be disciplined in that and not hiding. In that way, the world will know that your country is doing what it should do, and that people are acting responsibly. And that will make it easy for me and for other persons who have the responsibility to communicate that, so that you are not hampered internationally in your negotiation, your studies, and your tours, whatever it is. This is very, very important. And I think that by the end, you will become famous for having stopped this disease. That's what this is. As long as the world understands it, you will become famous for what you did. It is was a heroic deed. Yeah. But you need your neighbors to come along. You need the region to come along. Stopping your border for the neighboring countries is also not the right thing to do. Because that would make it worse for them. You don't want Europe and U.S. to stop their borders for you. We have to, we have to be responsible. This is too big, too long for life to stop. Life has to go on and we have to fight this in parallel. And we have to be for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are going to be famous for keeping Ebola up quickly. Yeah. You see, I think, I think those are more comments. Maybe good progress. There is always a good show in this evil. This one is very soon will be famous. But our result, our resilience, we continue this battle. Uh, we will close on a rather sad note, and by this, I'd like to extend our heartfelt uh, condolences to this Yoga James family and the family of. Uh, Mr. James Green. Zoga James was a, an outstanding journalist, a veteran journalist. He worked for Venita and then for the Liberia Broadcasting System. Looked at for being one of the respected sport journalists. Perhaps I have it. You have to leave us this area. Yeah.